right, go take your textbooks out. Open to page number 79. Page 79, you answered questions 1 through 8 last night for homework. So you began uh, looking at solids in more detail. We looked at liquids and gases already, getting to solids now. Numbers 1 through 8 on page 79. All right, somebody's answer is much more thorough there. All right. Uh, right small, okay, sure. Let's see how we did. Number one, define rigidity and resilience. And Michael, what did you have for number one? Rigidity is an object of resistance to deformations, and resilience is the deformation required to permanently change an object. Good. Uh, number two, define plasticity. Audrey? Plasticity is defined as the maximum amount of relative deformation that may be permanently imposed upon it. Upon an object. Good. Number three, describe three industrial processes for working metal. Michael? Forging is smashing the metal into shape. Rolling is pressing the metal, and drawing is pulling it in a long circle. Ish. Uh, what did you have for number three, Audrey? I think this might be one of the big areas where uh, her detail maybe was a little bit more uh, <coughs> accurate. Industrial processes for working metal are forging, rolling, and drawing. Oh, so all you did was list them? Uh -huh. It says describe. Yeah. He at least gave some description. I mean, it wasn't yeah. great, but oh, shame. All right, number four state Hooke's law for tensile force and for the restorative force and identify each variable. Audrey? Uh, Hooke's law states according to the tensile force that forces are on the cone upward is proportional to its. Displacement downward and the restorative force acts in the opposite direction of the displacement. Okay. Um, be, because I said identify each variable, I think they were looking for an equation or a formula. Have equation. You have equations here. Can you keep going? Um, FT equals KX and FR equals negative KX. Okay. And the variables, um, F stands for the water. Um, X is the amount of stress, and K is the constant of proportionality. And then the other one that, um, is force against the object, um, and then you have the negative, and then the constant, and the amount of stress. Okay, all right, not bad there. Yeah, the F sub T is the tensile force pulling on, these, on the wire, and the F sub R is the restorative force of the wire internally. All right, number five, how is stress defined? How is strain defined? Michael. Stress is a deformative tensile force upon an area, and strain is the amount of deformation that the object undergoes. Good. Or rather, we could say relative deformation. Uh, let's see, number six. What's the relationship between stress and strain for small deformations of a solid material? Audrey? Um, the relationship between stress and strain for small deformations of a solid material is proportional. Is that they are proportional, right? Stress and strain are proportional for small deformations of a solid material. Number seven, what is the proportionality constant for tensile stress called, and to what is it equal? Michael? Um, tensile stress is equal to strain. Um, K is the proportionality constant. I thought you were uh, yeah, yeah, I think you weren't looking at the correct page for this answer. Audrey, what did you have for number seven? The proportionality constant for tensile stress, and to what is it equal? Uh, proportionality constant for tensile stress is called Young's Good. Equal to force over area multiplied um, first by strain. Okay, so I think they were looking for is it's the um, Young's modulus is correct, and it's the amount of tensile force per unit area required to double the length of an object. So that's what we were looking at there. Um, let's see, number eight, name and define the four points on the graph of stress versus strain found in the text. So four terms, four definitions. Michael, give me the first two. Um, the material is the object, and y is the constant. I would probably look it up on one page because I got so confused for you guys. Yeah, so, so if you look in your homework reading, remember you were reading uh, pages 68 to 74. If you look at page 73, there's a graph of stress versus strain for a stretching wire. You see that? Graph of stress versus strain. And then there's four points on there. They wanted you to define those four points. And it's also a section of the book called Graph of Stress Versus Strain. So that's another reason why, because uh, we should have had four terms and definitions all in this one question. That's, I was looking at the moduli for various solid materials. Ah, uh, instead of the graph of stress versus strain. 
All right, uh, Audrey, what did you have for number eight? Is the fourth point there? Yeah, so uh, you kind of got it, kind of didn't got it. We'll talk about all of it anyway. Uh, that will actually come up more tomorrow. Um, but uh, at least you looked in the correct section uh, <laughs> and had most of the correct terms there. So make sure we're putting forth adequate effort on our homework. All right, that said, let's go and open up our notes. I'll open up your notes. And uh, looking at our third and final state of matter, again, we will not touch on plasma um, in this class more than what we already did in defining what it is. Uh, but we talked a lot about liquids, most abundant state of matter. And there are lots of different things we looked at with liquids, right? The force a liquid exerts, the uh, pressure a liquid will exert, the fact that pressure could be constant if it's confined, the application of a hydraulic device, things floating with Archimedes principle, even look briefly for Newley's principle, principle of continuity, well, lots of stuff with liquids because liquids can move. And where there's movement, there's stuff to be studied, right? Gases even can be freely flowing, things can move in gases. We saw some cool demonstrations of atmospheric pressure and uh, different things like that. But again, a gas can move. What about a solid? It's just there, right? Definite shape, definite volume. So we're not looking at the volume expanding necessarily. Well, we will in chapter 14 if you heat it. Uh, we weren't necessarily looking at the, the object moving because it just sits there, right? Because of their definite shape, there's not quite as much to talk about with solids. Except that a solid doesn't quite have a definite shape. For instance, Michael's arm bones, radius and ulna, right? The ulna's the big one in the top and the radius is down under, right? The arm bone has roughly a definite shape, right? Unless I smash it, and then it doesn't have a definite shape anymore. I didn't actually smash it, just in case you're wondering. Um, but right, solids, this desktop has a definite shape unless I take an ax to it, right? This bar has a definite shape unless, uh, okay, I don't actually want to damage it. Um, I'm not sure if I could, I'm not sure how strong this actually is. It doesn't feel very strong. It's probably just a limit. It probably is not particularly strong. But anyway, right, metal, solids, they have definite shapes until they don't, until they can be deformed. So we're going to focus on, really through this entire chapter, is just this aspect of deforming solids. Because outside of that, solids aren't a whole lot of fun. Okay? They're necessary in life, obviously, but there's not a lot of physics to study with them unless you're looking at deforming them. Uh, the book talks about glass. Some people will say it's a super cool. Right? It's a, you know, and so it, it can slowly melt. Well, yeah, all solids, a lot of solids can, can be melted down. Even like, so, uh, metal can be melted down, right? So yes, over time, the glass perhaps could flow down. But they found a lot of cases, they just didn't make the glass properly in the first place, and so the edges didn't get rolled properly. You read about that as well. But uh, we're, not, we're not necessarily talking about things like that. Uh, but we are looking at deformation. So the first thing you need to know about solids in your notes is that they have a definite shape. That's what sets them apart. Solids have a definite shape. That's what sets them apart from the fluids, if you will. But external forces, Michael, can cause deformation. External forces can cause deformation. This is what makes Play-Doh a solid. Does Play-Doh have a definite shape? Well, it can be easily changed, but it still takes a force to change it. If Plato just sits there, all things being equal, it just sits there, Plato stays in its shape until something comes along to change its shape. Now, in some cases, you could heat it, right? Cause the molecular structure to break down, and, and all of a sudden you could change the shape if you melted Plato, I suppose. But Plato does have a definite shape, doesn't it? Right? Um, so definite shape, unless some external force acts on it, that's what makes something a solid. Which means that all solids, to some extent, have an ability to maintain their shape. Does that make sense? And we call this ability to maintain shape elasticity. Elasticity. Elasticity is the ability of a solid to maintain its shape. 
Now, what you're going to discover is the way I word things and the way the books word things varies quite a bit in this chapter. Not that the book definitions are wrong. I'm just going to try to make it a little easier to understand. Okay, so I'm defining it a little bit differently than the book does, though not erroneously, nor is the book wrong. Neither of us is wrong. It's just a different way of thinking and approaching it. The last thing you can be thought of is that the ability of a salad to maintain its shape. Now, there are two ways to maintain shape. For instance, if, um, if Michael were to stretch, his muscles' shape would be changed. Ah, but then when he goes back to resting position, the muscle regains its original shape. He deformed it, but it went back to its original shape without any trouble at all. It maintained its shape. Muscle is a solid. Michael's bone. If I were to pound on it, it would probably not fracture unless I pound it really hard. Okay? Why? It resists changing shape. I can't bend Michael's bone. Okay? Um, the, uh, the junior hires are actually doing an experiment in class this year um, soaking turkey leg bones in different substances and seeing how it affects the bendability of the bone. But assuming we're not soaking his arm bone in vinegar or something, his arm bone doesn't get bent, right? It just, if it's going to break, it'll break. But it really doesn't deform much. It resists deformation. And in that way, his arm maintains shape. Two ways things can maintain shape. One, don't get deformed in the first place. Number two, if you do get deformed, bounce back from it. Does that make sense? So there's two different aspects to elasticity. The first is what we usually think of, and that's resilience. Resilience. Here's how I'm going to define resilience. Resilience is the ability of a solid to recover its shape after deformation. The ability of a solid to recover its original shape after deformation. The ability of a solid to recover its original shape after deformation. And this is what we think of, don't we, when we think of elastic, right? You think of, for instance, in a pair of pants or a pair of shorts or a skirt or something, the elastic, right? You stretch it out, put it on, and pop. It's, it snaps tight to your body so that way it doesn't fall down in the middle of class, which would be unfortunate, right? Now, it happens sometimes that elastic perhaps gets overstretched, right? Or something happens to cause it to lose that elasticity. You're like, oh... These no longer snap back to my person. My wife borrowed a pair of my shorts while she was pregnant. That pair of shorts no longer bounces back. <laughs> the elasticity is gone. The shorts were disposed of, okay? She stretched the shorts so much, they were no longer, we would say, elastic. It no longer had resilience to where it would bounce back and recover shape. Now, the way the book describes it is having this, what we call, elastic limit. Right? High resilience means high elastic limit. If something is highly resilient, you can do a lot to it, and it'll still bounce back. I think of resilience as a quality of everyday life, right? a quality of maturity. right? The ability to handle, say, adversity in our lives and bounce back from it. Right? Maybe there's an unfortunate event that takes place. Um, my, uh, my son, five years old, so you know, he's a boy. He does... Naughty things that five-year-old boys uh, are tempted to do and have to learn not to, right? And my big encouragement to him was, look, don't let a bad day define you. Bounce back from it. Have a good day tomorrow, right? Well, that's hard for a five-year-old. Hopefully, it's a lot easier for us. Have a bad day, bounce back from it. Maybe even academically. You know, Kendall has been out for a week there of classes, right? How do you bounce back from that? It's hard, but you've got to. Right? Keep it like, well, school year's over, no sense trying out as fail physics the rest of the year. No, you bounce back from it. And that's what resilience is. That which is resilient bounces back. High elastic limit. It can tolerate a lot before it becomes permanently deformed. That's the way the book describes it. Here's the way, here's the next aspect of elasticity, though, is just not getting deformed. And that's rigidity. Rigidity. The ability of a solid to resist deformation. Rigidity is the ability of a solid to resist deformation. Just don't get deformed in the first place. Now, you wouldn't think of a suit of armor as being very elastic, would you? Right? <laughs> Let me pull on my elastic metal leggings here and put on my... You don't think of it as elastic, but in a way it is because it resists deformation, right? It takes a great deal of force to deform suit of armor. But that's not how we think of elasticity, which makes this a harder one to process. 
Um, if you look in your textbooks at uh, page 69, you see that little diagram where it shows different balls being bounced and how high they would bounce? And uh, if you were to bounce something, for instance, from a height of 100 inches, well, lead is a soft material. It has very little resilience, very little rigidity. It just sort of deforms and barely bounces at all. Wood would bounce higher, rubber higher still, which is usually what we think of with a bouncy ball, right? If you think of rubber. A steel ball will bounce higher, and a glass ball higher still, as long as it doesn't break, okay? Um, why? Because while resilience in the rubber ball causes it to bounce, if you were to watch the rubber ball as it strikes the ground, you'd see it smush at the bottom. Have you ever seen one of those pictures snapped right at the moment a ball hits something and it just smushes in? But then it pops back into shape and that popping back into shape causes it to rebound and bounce up. Play-Doh, you throw it down, it deforms and it doesn't rebound. It just stays down there, right? But a rubber ball bounces back and hence rises up. The steel ball bounces, but if you look at its moment of contact, virtually no deformation whatsoever. Glass the same way unless it breaks. And then you've got a whole other issue on your hands, right? Then nothing's bouncing. Fragments everywhere. All right? The, what the caption should say is balls with greater elasticity bounce higher. So cross out the word resilience. They are wrong in using that term there. Balls with greater elasticity bounce higher. Steel does not have high resilience. It does not bounce back from deformation well. Glass certainly does not bounce back from deformation well, but those latter two resist deformation, which gives them a high degree of elasticity still. It's just because it's got rigidity to it. Questions on those two aspects of elasticity. Again, it's weird to think of something not, you know, like strike this. Man, that is really elastic. That's not how we think, but it's a property of maintaining shape. Now, some things, as I already mentioned, Play-Doh, they get deformed very easily, right? Um, they have a high degree of what's called plasticity, which would be the opposite. Plasticity. Plasticity, that which is very moldable. Here's the definition I'll give you. The ability of a solid to be permanently deformed. The ability of a solid to be permanently deformed is plasticity. Ability to be permanently deformed. It's not bouncing back. It's not recovering its shape. It's just going to stay that way. Now, as Christians, we need to have both plasticity and elasticity, don't we? Particularly rigidity, I would say, right? But of resilience as well, right? In our Christian life, we need to be moldable in God's hand, right? We need to allow God to shape and mold us into what he wants us to be. At the same time, not allowing the world to shape us, correct? Right? Not going off to college, for instance, and allowing whatever this professor, that professor, this friend says to influence us. We need the rigidity to resist deformation, if you will, right? But at the same time, allowing... God to shape and mold our lives the way he wants to. And then certainly resilience, you know, when you do stumble and fall, because we all do, to bounce back, get back up from it, right? A just man falleth seven times and it riseth up again. Very important there. Anyway, so plasticity, easily deformed. I think of Plato. Highly plastic is a way we could describe it. A high degree of plasticity. It don't take much force to permanently deform the Plato. I say permanently, <laughs> then you redeform it again, and now it's permanently deformed until the next external force. Uh, this is the reason, I think the term plasticity derived from plastic, right? Why are action figures and toys made out of plastic? Because you can shape them pretty easily into whatever you want them to be, right? That's why most things are made of plastic. Now, what about metals? Would metals be elastic or plastic? Elastic, specifically rigid, correct? Unless you heat them up, right? That softens the metal, and then molten metal can be worked. So as we talked about, pla as we talked about plasticity, Molten metal now falls under this category. Regular metal is not, for the record. You can't take this thing and start shaping it the way we're about to talk about. Molten metal, softened metal, heated metal can be worked with. And there are three metal working processes you read about in your homework. The first metal working process that I'm going to talk about is called drawing. Drawing. Has nothing to do with art class. The idea is that the metal is forced or drawn through a single hole die. Okay, D-I-E doesn't mean, <laughs> nor is it D-Y-E, which is like pigmentation that you put on a shirt like tie-dye. Okay, but dye is simply a, a particular shape that you want. Cut a hole, force the metal through it. Draw the metal through. And as the metal is drawn through, it forms a long continuous wire or a continuous ribbon. So drawing is the process whereby metal is formed into wires. Um, you ever seen um, spaghetti being made? Like the actual, the actual um, 
pasta and it's softened for being made into spaghetti. Uh, it's kind of neat. I think Trigoli makes their own fresh spaghetti, if I'm not mistaken, their own fresh pasta themselves. They don't buy them and cook, you know, prepackaged off the Walmart shelf pasta. Um, but in a similar sense, molten metal can be drawn through a single cut die into what the shape that they want, drawn into wires. The property of metals that allows them to be drawn into wires is called ductility. So the process is called drawing and the property is called ductility. Metals with a high degree of ductility can be drawn into wires more easily. Uh, platinum, for instance, highly ductile, can be drawn into very, very thin wire. I've, I've heard, you know, fraction of the width of a human hair. We look at Audrey's hair and we're like, wow, one hair is really thin. Why Audrey's? Because it's longer and easier to see. Um, but anybody's hair, right? Wow, that hair is really thin. Thinner than that, you could draw the metal into wire. Um, and that's because it's highly ductile. Some metals aren't. Some metals are not particularly ductile. Gold, for instance, is not highly ductile. Um, that it's just really expensive, so people don't want to make gold wire, but it's not nearly as ductile. Another process is called rolling. Rolling. And this is where two heavy rollers, the metal's forced between them, and just keeps, as they roll, they force the metal into a thin sheet. Uh, think of aluminum foil, right? Is a thin sheet of metal that's been rolled into the sheet. So rolling is the process by which metal is rolled into a continuous sheet. Metal is rolled into a continuous sheet. They use two heavy rollers, so they call the process rolling. The property of metal that allows it to be rolled into sheets is called malleability. Malleability is the property of metals that allows them to be rolled into sheets. Now you might be thinking, duct. A duct is that which leads or draws, correct? Drawing, ductility kind of makes sense. Wires lead, you know, from one you know, outlet to another outlet. I kind of get ductility, malleability. Well, at one point, metals were not rolled into sheets, but rather hammered into sheets. And malleability, the ability to be hit by a mallet or a hammer, is where the term comes from. Gold is highly malleable. Silver is both, ductile and malleable. Gold is highly malleable. It can be hammered or rolled into extremely thin sheets of foil. Um, how many of you have a Bible with your name printed on the front in gold or silver? Okay. Um, I worked for a bookstore in college, and we would, our, our, I never did it, one of my friends did, but I, uh, I saw the machine, they didn't, they didn't have me actually do this, but you, they would take extremely thin sheets of actual gold foil, put it over the Bible cover, heat the press, set the type, and then press the gold into the leather cover. And it was just a very thin sheet of gold foil along the edge of your Bible, that gold leafing. Okay, just extremely thin foil. That's why it flakes off so easily. And then pretty soon after you've used your Bible a while, oh, it's not shiny anymore. Got a brand new Bible, that really shiny edge. Looking at it in church when you're supposed to be listening. Very malleable. Okay, it can be rolled into or made into very, very thin sheets. The last one is called forging or sometimes called casting. Your book doesn't use the term, but I want you to know both terms. Forging or casting. The idea here is that a die is constructed often out of uh, other metal uh, in advance of the shape that you want it to be. Now you can craft metal in a lot of other ways. These are the three major metal processes, but you'd make a die of whatever shape you want the metal to be. Force the metal in, pound the metal in, and once it's cooled, remove the die and you have what shape you want. In some cases, you'll use two dies and you'll put them back to back and you'll force the metal into them force them, pound them together. When the metal cools, take off both sides and you have a two-sided shape. For instance, um, your dad's toolbox, or maybe you have tools of your own, either of you have tools of your own, a wrench, right? Oftentimes it'll say die cast steel. Why? Well, they took a die of exactly the shape they wanted, two halves, put them together, force the metal between them, let it cool, take it apart, and you've got something very, very strong because the metal has now formed into that shape. A student of mine took a metalworking class in another school before coming, and he gave this to me. Now, you can tell the back side's kind of rough, so it wasn't a two-sided die, but I believe this is just aluminum, if I'm not mistaken, but he cast a, a Patriot, not for Patriots, New England Patriots, like a Patriot, says United States uh, Bicentennial, okay? And he, he cast a die to begin with, poured the metal in, and this is what came out when he was done, okay? 
Um, so cast and very, very strong. I could strike it on Michael's head. It wouldn't even break, wouldn't even deform at all. I, don't, I just like picking on Michael. <laughs> so that is what happens when you're the only guy in the class. But uh, yeah, very, very strong because it's been forged or cast. And a lot of metal toys that you might play with or see or maybe play with in the past die cast, okay? Um, I think of little toy cars, because I have a son, little toy cars are oftentimes die cast. Okay? They, they set the mold of what they want, put the metal into the die, and it's cast or forged that way. This is a three process of working metals. Again, not because metals are plastic or have a high degree of plasticity, but when you heat them, now they have a higher degree of plastic, plasticity and you can work with them. Questions on that? All right, so we said that in general though, solids have a definite shape because they resist deformation, yes? However, if you were to um, pull on a solid, as you pulled on the solid, you'd be pulling on those molecules. Now they have a strong attraction to each other. What do we call the attraction of molecules to each other within the same substance? Cohesion. Solids have incredibly strong cohesive bonds. So internal cohesion of the molecules of a solid, for instance, we take this, um, we take this piece of metal and I pull on it and you're like, nothing's going to happen. You're exactly right, nothing would. We could take this rod here and pull on the ends of it and nothing is going to happen, not perceptibly, right? No perceptible change, because the cohesive forces are strong. But as you do pull apart, if you were to continue to apply that force and apply that force and apply that force, little by little you could, now it might be at the microscopic level, cause a stretching to take place. It's easier if you use something like, say, a rubber band, right? Pull on a rubber band, as you apply force, it stretches. Or some things like a spring that's designed to stretch out, right? Pull on it, it's designed with the coil shape, structure, that it can be stretched out, correct? But the more you pull, the more it stretches, right? It's pretty, pretty straightforward, okay? Um, so we call the force that stretches a solid, or stretches in general, tensile force. Tensile force. Tensile force is a force that stretches a solid. Basically, forces that act in opposite directions on the ends of the solid would cause stretching. Now, um, Robert Hooke noted this. We got a rubber band here, right? And um, if I, uh, it's just kind of sitting here loosely. I pull right here. It's really not stretched at all. If I start to pull more, right, it stretches more and more and more. And Robert Hooke noticed something. As I stretch it more, I have to keep applying more and more force to stretch it. Hmm. The more force I apply, the more it stretches. That's pretty cool. And since he noticed this, he named this law after himself, and he called it Hooke's Law. So Hooke's Law is the more, you, the more force you apply, the more something stretches. Don't you wish you discovered that first? Audrey's Law. Since we won't use last names here. But the last name would be even better. All right. Okay, to be fair to Robert Hooke, he noted more than just, hey, the more force I apply, the more it stretches. He noticed this. Not only does it just stretch more, but it stretches proportionally. So Robert Hooke noticed that tensile force is proportional to the amount of stretch. We'll notate tensile force F sub T, and this symbol, it looks kind of like the infinity symbol that you don't close up at the end. This means is proportional to, you'll see that a lot this year. Tensile force is proportional to, and he wasn't sure quite how to notate stretch, so he called it X. And tensile force is proportional to stretch. Well, you, you all have played with different sizes and types of rubber bands, right? You can't apply the same amount of force to every rubber band, can you? The thicker rubber bands, you can apply more force to, to get stretched. In fact, you have to apply more force to, to get the same stretch, right? Skinny rubber bands, you try to apply more force, in some cases they break, right? So for every substance, the amount of stretch will be different based on the amount of force, but they'll always be proportional to each other. And every individual object has a different ratio of proportionality, a different constant of proportionality. We can extrapolate this out to get this equation for Hooke's Law. The tensile force equals some proportionality constant, and again, for every object that's going to be different, times stretch. So every object will have every size of rubber band, Every type of rubber band, every thickness of rubber will have its own proportionality constant. But in every case, it will be proportional stretch 
to the tensile force that's applied. Well, we know this as well, though. And we call this specifically this equation Hooke's Law. We know this as well, though. As I pull on the rubber band, it begins pulling back against me, correct? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as I pull, it pulls back against me, right? Audrey's, Audrey's locked in, so is Michael. As I pull, it pulls back against me. And we know this is true because if I were to let go, it would fly forward and hit Michael, wouldn't it? Right? Well, it's not the tensile force that causes it. The tensile force is causing it to stretch apart. It's the restorative force that causes it back to, co to come back together. There's the force pulling against me, right? So we'll see if we can uh, shoot Kendall right in the face. Nope, just overshot the camera. See if I can hit the lens with the rubber band that I missed. All right, well, went right over your head, Kendall. Okay, I'm not gonna make any more jokes about that one. Uh, <laughs> ah, poor Kendall. We love you, Kendall. <laughs> Anyway, but it's the restorative force, right? There's a force that resists further stretching, that makes it hard to keep stretching. So we can also say that we have a restorative force. Well, what is the restorative force? It's going to be equal to the amount of other force, right? However much force I pull, pull with, that's how much force it pulls back with, correct? If that weren't the case, it would break. In fact, that's what causes breaking is I start applying more force than it can handle. Okay, I can't pull back with that amount of force. The cohesive bonds within the rubber, latex, whatever this actually is, can't handle it anymore, and so they break, correct? But until it breaks, whatever force I'm pulling with is how much force it is pulling back with, but in the opposite direction, correct? So we would say that restorative force is also equal to the constant of proportionality times the stretch, but in the opposite direction. And in physics, we show the opposite direction using a negative sign. You need to know that in physics, a negative sign indicates the opposite direction. I pull the rubber band away from Michael. I don't want the rubber band to hit Michael, so I'm pulling away from Michael. But oops, my thumb slipped. But uh, <laughs> he doesn't believe me. Uh, it really did. It just was intentionally slipping. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the restorative force is what pulled it back towards Michael. See, it wasn't my tensile force that shot the rubber band at Michael. It was the rubber band's restorative force. Mm -hmm. But Michael's like, but Mr. Dasky, had it not been for your tensile force, there would have been no restorative force to build up to cause it to strike me. And he would be right. This is true. Uh, but the restorative force, negative kx. So again, the key would be to figure out what is that proportionality constant, for instance, for this rubber band. I have, I have another rubber band here. And if you look at them closely, Michael, you'll notice that the thickness this way, even the thickness this way is different, right? So they're not identical rubber bands, which means these two rubber bands will have different constants of proportionality. You can see they're different thicknesses, okay? I don't know the camera can see that very well, but the thickness of the rubber bands itself is different. So these would have different uh, proportionality constants. Um, so figure out what is that proportionality constant for the rubber band. And then based on the amount of stretch, that determines how much force is needed, or based on how much force is applied, that's how much stretch will take place. Make sense? All right, we're going to work on this math a little bit more in our next lesson. Tonight, there is no homework. Um, so uh, we'll pick up with the rest of last night's homework reading and those homework questions in our next lesson.